Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. This is the second video in a series of how to set up an easy and powerful smart home. And in this video, we're going to be taking a look at the secret sauce of the smart home that allows the communication between devices, and that's the smart home protocols. So let's get to it. Setting up a smart home can be overwhelming, but trust me, with a little bit of understanding of the different protocols, you can set up a powerful and easy to manage smart home that you're going to love and simplifies your life. Think of these protocols as the universal language that your devices use to communicate with one another and with any hubs you may have. Get these right and you'll have smooth sailing down the road and it'll be a much better experience for you. So now I'm going to break down the different protocols. The first connection protocol we're going to talk about is Wi-Fi. And I'm going to include LAN here as well. So if you use Ethernet cords to physically connect your devices. So anything on your local network. And what's really great about this is everybody's already familiar with Wi-Fi. You're already using it. And you probably have, you know, um, a lot of devices already that are on your Wi-Fi, which can cause the problems as well. The key benefits here are that it's widely available. You have, you know, really wide bandwidths here. So if you need to connect a camera or other data hog, this is a good option for that. And there is easy setup for most devices. So these are some positives, but what are the negatives? Well, one is you could overwhelm your Wi-Fi. If you have a lot of devices here, I've seen a lot of systems really struggle with the Wi-Fi connections when you have, you know, dozens and dozens of devices, maybe certain connections after it's into the hundreds. Um, but that's not really uncommon in a smart home if you're relying heavily on Wi-Fi. Another issue you have to worry about here is the range of your router. So you need to figure out, you know, how far out can you have these Wi-Fi devices? And if you don't have, you know, something out in that area that can repeat the Wi-Fi, you may have some issues. And finally, the last con for the Wi-Fi would be the power consumption. It's definitely much more power hungry than some of the other protocols we're about to talk about. The next set of protocols I'm going to talk about are Zigbee and Z-Wave. These are low power consumption and mesh network protocols that allow for a communication between devices. Um, so you could have, say, an outlet plugged in that's using Zigbee or Z-Wave that can repeat it. Um, the signal from the main hub. So this would be where you have a hub. Maybe it's a smart things or home assistant with a dongle that connects into the Zigbee or Z-Wave um, bandwidth. And then you can repeat it out and create that mesh network where you have repeater points throughout your house. And this works really well, even for large homes. We have a lot of these devices at our house. I want to say it's probably over 100 devices between Zigbee and Z-Wave. And I'm going to break down the benefits of both here for you in a, in a second and then talk about a couple of the devices that you might look for in these uh, protocols as well. The benefits of both Zigbee and Z-Wave are these are low power devices that create that mesh network so you can extend it pretty far and they don't interfere with your Wi-Fi. So you can you know, have a lot more devices on your Wi-Fi um, that are non-smart home devices without really having to worry about things like your smart home devices getting in the way. Uh, some of the cons, well, you do have to have that mesh network. So you have to have some type of hub and they both have lower bandwidth than the Wi-Fi does. So if you're looking for high bandwidth items such as cameras, this is not going to be the protocol that you're going to be able to go with. So no Zigbee or Z-Wave. So what are the differences really between Zigbee and Z-Wave and what are the advantages? Uh, Zigbee, in uh, my experience, is definitely the lower cost option. Why wouldn't you go with the lowest cost option? Well, sometimes it doesn't have interoperability with other devices. So if you have two different brands, sometimes they don't like to communicate with each other. And that's one that I see from Acara. Their devices do not tend to utilize repeaters other than Acara smart plugs. So I, when I have Acara, I make sure I have Acara smart plugs. The Acara smart plugs do tend to repeat for other devices, but uh, not vice versa. So it's a complicated situation there. And then what are the positives and negatives of Z-Wave versus Zigbee? Um, it has the same pros and cons overall. The negative for Z-Wave is the cost. It definitely tends to cost more than the equivalent Zigbee devices, but the devices work really well with each other. So you have a lot of uh, devices that are on that protocol that just work seamlessly with each other. Not doesn't matter the brand or anything else. So that's really the positive for the Z-Wave and why you'd wanna maybe lean that way if you have the funds to do so. Most of the devices in our house are definitely Zigbee because the cost is much different and much better on the Zigbee, especially if you stick with one brand like we've done with Acara and bought a lot of their Zigbee devices, which have been 
very, very low cost and have worked exceptionally well for us. And I told you I'd tell you some devices that I like on the Zigbee and Z-Wave protocols. Obviously, I mentioned the Akara devices. So we have the smart plugs, the leak sensors, the door window open sensor, open and close sensor there, as well as the motion sensors from Akara. So those are definitely my favorite there on the uh, Zigbee brand or Zigbee protocol rather. And for Z-Wave, we again have some smart plugs because they're really good repeaters because they're always on, you know, the mains power, if you will, where they're connected into power. So they're not battery op operated devices and they can repeat for everything. Um, and we also have the water shutoff valve, which is really cool, as well as a device that listens for our smoke detector to go off. That's our Z-Wave device as well. So we definitely have a few devices there, but we have way more Zigbee devices than Z-Wave, again, because of the cost. Now let's move on to the new kid on the block. And that's thread or matter or matter over thread, if you will. And that's a situation where you're utilizing a different bandwidth and different um, connection protocol. And I have talked about matter in the past. So there's another video, you can look at it up here if you want to, where I talk about, you know, where's matter at and where the future is going there. Um, but just to keep it pretty simple, Thread is another Zigbee Z-Wave type uh, protocol. It's, you know, the protocol for the future, if you will. And, you know, there's positives and negatives to it. You have some of the same positives as you do with the Zigbee and Z-Wave, such as being able to use devices across brands, um, having, you know, low power devices and not clogging up your Wi-Fi network. But the big issue that I have with uh, Thread is the fact that it costs way too much money for these devices. It may be the, uh, you know, protocol of the future, but why do I want to invest so much money to, you know, be on the cutting edge here when I have devices that are Zigbee and Z-Wave for almost 10 years now with, you know, no issues at all. So I'm going to go with those low, low cost options and operate everything on those mesh networks for the most part at this time and then consider Thread as the prices drop because the prices are going to have to drop for those to really have staying power here in the market. People just aren't going to pay these insane prices when you can have a comparable device on Zigbee or Z-Wave at a much lower cost, especially on Zigbee. Um, the, really, the, the big benefit here is that the thread border routers, which is, you know, the hub, if you will, for the thread network, is going to be incorporated in a lot more devices. It's already in a lot of uh, smart home speaker systems. Um, so if you're talking about like Google Home or the Amazon uh, Smart Assistant or the Apple uh, HomeKit smart speakers that you have, you know, in those, that's where you're looking for those thread border routers. So it is much more accessible than some of the Zigbee or Z-Wave that are not in as many devices, and you may need a more dedicated situation there. So how do you choose the right device protocol for your smart home? Well, I have a couple things that I consider before I make that final decision. First of all, what are the options for the devices that you're looking for? So if you're talking about a smart plug, you have tons of options. You can get Zigbee, Z-Wave, um, you can get, you know, Wi-Fi, smart plugs. So you have, you know, every option there, but what else did you want to put in your smart home? So back to that first video, when you made your list of what are you looking to build out in your smart home and how do you want this, you know, to work together, you have to think about, you know, which protocols do I want to build longer term? Because if I'm going to, you know, have more sensors say, and I'm going to look at, you know, leak sensors or open door or open closed sensors for doors and windows, um, I'm probably going to look more at Zigbee. And if I'm looking at Zigbee for those devices, I'm probably going to get the Zigbee plug as well. So when would I get Wi-Fi? If I only want to have, you know, very simple automations and not a lot of other sensors, I would consider it for the plugs. Certainly consider it for other devices like the smart mops and vacuums. They're, you know, definitely a Wi-Fi device. Um, I don't know of any offhand that, you know, operate on another protocol at this point. So those are pretty standard that's going to be on Wi-Fi. If you're looking at something like a smart lawnmower or something like that, um, you're probably going to be looking at a Wi-Fi device. Again, I don't think that they operate, you know, very often on anything other than uh, the LAN, you know, your local area network. And the other item, you definitely want to be looking at the Wi-Fi or power over Ethernet 
our cameras. So make sure that if you're looking at these devices, and again, in this instance, Real Link is my favorite. There's a lot of videos if you look across my channel because definitely my favorite smart home camera setup. Um, integrates really well with Home Assistant as well as some other uh, smart home technology, you know, systems. So definitely recommend those, but really you want to stick to, uh, you know, having a Wi-Fi or, uh, or power over Ethernet. Finally, other items around your house, such as appliances or maybe some smart lights, like outdoor permanent lights that you might have from Govi or Asaham or another brand. Um, those a lot of times are on Wi-Fi as well. So if you do have these devices on Wi-Fi, what you want to do is you want to make sure you have a really strong mesh network of some type, um, either lots of access points. So we have several access points on our um, Unify setup that we have here. Um, if you don't have that, maybe you have uh, Google Home, you know, the, uh, the routers there uh, with the hubs. And um, there's also some from other brands, but I didn't have a whole lot of success either with Google or uh, the Amazon uh, Echoes once I got to a lot of devices. Just had a lot of issues with those once I got into, you know, maybe six dozen or so devices. Definitely once I hit 100 devices, I was really, you know, having a lot of issues with those. Um, having, you know, really uh, uh, enterprise level or corporate type level uh, Wi-Fi setup is, is really the answer for me. I really like the Unify in our smart home. Next category, the Zigbee and Z-Wave. I think this is really where smart homes should live at this point. Um, yeah, you do need some type of hub, but even the Amazon Echo has, you know, I think it's the Zigbee, you know, um, connection in it. So you do have some options there. If you really want a powerful smart home, you know, even though historically it's not been quite as easy, it definitely has come around here in the last year or two, and that is Home Assistant. You put in the dongle for the Z Zigbee and for the Z-Wave, and you have a great, 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 super powerful system. There's very little you can't figure out and do there, um, and very little requires anything other than, you know, just using the app to set everything up. Much different experience than it has been in the past. Um, with that being said, my next video that I'm going to put out on this smart home series is going to be talking more about your system of choice, your smart home hubs. So make sure you tune in for that one. Like and subscribe so you don't miss it when I release that video. And another item to mention here is that these are all your low power devices. So not only, you know, are you not using a whole lot of your battery when you're using the Zigbee or Z-Wave, but you also have it set up where it's uh, low cost integration items as well. In the Zigbee and Z-Wave, this is, like I said, where I'd be looking at all of my sensors and my plugs as well, if I'm looking at sensors. So the water leak sensors, the motion sensors, the door and window open and close sensors, all of those things are definitely, you know, I'm looking at Zigbee or Z-Wave, the smart plugs, the water shutoff valve, lots of options here, um, sirens, and the uh, smoke detector um, listener that we have right beside it is also Z-Wave. So definitely a plethora of devices here. And once you set up that really strong mesh network, those devices last a very long time on those batteries. You can set them and forget them, and it's wonderful. And it saves you money, which I'm all about. As far as thread and matter, Definitely consider it if your budget allows, but right now I just keep an eye on it. See how that goes. If it's something, you know, on sale or fits into your home really well, you can definitely make that splurge and buy that because you are going to future proof a little bit in your home. There's definitely dedication to matter across the industry. Um, but I would say at this point, it's really not necessary to go down that rabbit hole, especially if you aren't fully invested um, or have a lot of disposable, mo disposable money to uh, throw at this venture. And I also want to mention that you shouldn't be afraid to mix and match or use some other wireless protocols that I haven't even mentioned here, such as ClearConnect, the Lutron cassette uses or LoRa that's you know a longer range um, you know connection so there's a lot of other options as well if you're staying you know within one company um, or you have a situation where for example at our house we have 70 plus uh, Lutron cassette devices and we have one hub for those they're you know a mixture of wired devices and remote controls that you know either fit on the wall or we have at different locations in the house so they all interconnect through that one hub and that connects directly 
directly with several of the other smart home systems. So it allows that to be, you know, self-sufficient and self-contained, but also accessible to everything else at the same time. And as I mentioned, don't be afraid to do the mixing and matching. So if you buy, you know, a couple Zigbee devices and a few Z-Wave devices, some uh, Wi-Fi devices, and then you have some power over Ethernet cameras, that's really okay. Um, the biggest thing is going to be making sure that they play well together if that's what you're looking to do with different automations. And that's why you're going to want to pay attention to the next video where we talk about that and, you know, the smart home systems. My big tip, though, for the smart home protocols is to start small. Take your time. Enjoy the process. Enjoy learning about it and enjoy having those simple automations that you're going to build upon. You probably don't have the time or budget, like I said in the first video, to really do everything at once. So once you had that plan laid out, think about the things that are going to be most impactful to your life. Maybe it's the smart robot that vacuums and mops. Maybe it's the Yarbo outside doing your lawn mowing and your snow cleaning, you know, snow blowing and snow plowing. Maybe it's that you have uh, some smart lights and a, a smart a voice assistant that you talk to and tell it to turn on or off the lights so that you can lay down in bed and, you know, turn off the lights or turn on the fan or do whatever you want to do. Maybe it's some motion sensors with some lights and you create some situations where it's dynamic in your house. You have a lot of options, but you don't need to rush into it. Enjoy the process. What are your favorite smart home devices and protocols? Let me know in the comments section below because I wanna make sure I'm serving your needs as I continue to make future videos. I wanna make sure they're on topic for you. As I stated, understanding these protocols may seem very technical at first, but it's really foundational to make sure your smart home is set up as you need it and you don't have a lot of rework or you minimize disruptions later where you realize, well, I should have bought this, that, or the other thing instead of what I bought. And that's really where we get to the next video where I talk about the smart home systems of choice and which one you should choose and why. So stay tuned to that video.